Bleak House by Charles Dickens, Chapter 15, Bell Yard. While we were in London, Mr. Jarndyce was constantly beset by the crowd of excitable ladies and gentlemen whose proceedings had so much astonished us. Mr. Quayle, who presented himself soon after our arrival, was in all such excitements. He seemed to project those two shining knobs of temples of his into everything that went on. All objects were alike to him, but he was always particularly ready for anything in the way of a testimonial to anyone. His great, perp his great power seemed to be his power of indiscriminate admiration. Having first seen him perfectly swallowed up in admiration by Mrs. Jellyby, I had supposed her to be the absorbing object of his devotion. I soon discovered my mistake and found him to be train-bearer and organ-blower to a whole procession of people. Mrs. Particle wrote a letter of introduction to my guardian on behalf of her eloquent friend Mr. Gusher. With Mr. Gusher appeared Mr. Quayle again, Mr. Gusher being a flabby gentleman with a moist surface and eyes so much too small for his moon of a face that they seemed to have been originally made for somebody else, was not at first sight prepossessing. Yet, he was scarcely seated before Mr. Quayle asked Ada and me, not inaudibly, whether we were not struck by his massive configuration of brow. In short, we heard of a great many missions of various sorts among this set of people, but it was Mr. Quayle's mission to be in ecstasies with everybody else's mission, and that it was the most popular mission of all. Mr. Jarndyce had fallen into this company in the tenderness of his heart and his earnest desire to do all the good in his power, but that he felt it to be too often an unsatisfactory company where benevolence took, a, took spasmodic forms, where charity was assumed as a regular uniform by loud professors and speculators in cheap notary and cheap notoriety, vehement in profession, restless and vain in action, servile in the last degree of meanness to the great adultery of one another, and intolerable to those who are anxious quietly to help the weak from falling, he plainly told us. I mention this because I am coming to Mr. Skimpole again. It seemed to me that his offhand professions of childishness and carelessness were a great relief to my guardian, by contrast with such things, Mr. Skimpole appeared one morning his, in his usual agreeable way and full of pleasant spirits as ever. Boythorn writes me that, he, that you and the ladies have promised him a short visit in his bachelor house in Lincolnshire, observed Mr. Skimpole. He has informed me and proposes to frank me down and back again. I suppose it will cost money, shillings perhaps, or pounds, or something of that sort. By the by... Coavines, you remember our friend. Coavinses, Miss Summerson? Oh, yes, and I. Coavinses has been arrested by the great bailiff, said Mr. Skimpole. His successor is in my house now, in possession, I think he calls it. And he told me Coavinces had left three children, no mother, and that Coavinces' profession being unpopular, the rise in Coavinces were at considerable disadvantage. Mr. Jarndyce got up, rubbing his head, and began to walk about. I don't like this, Skimpole, he said thoughtfully. The man was necessary, pursued my guardian. There was no harm in his trade. He maintained his children. One would like to know more about this. Oh, coavinces, cried Mr. Skimpole at length, perceiving what he meant. Nothing easier. A walk to coavinces' headquarters, and you can, can know what you will. Mr. Jarndyce nodded to us, who were only waiting for the signal. Come, we will walk that way, my dears. Why not that way as soon as another? We were quickly ready and went out. Mr. Skimpole went with us. He took us first to Cursitor Street, Chancery Lane, where there was a house with barred windows, which he called Coavinces Castle. On our going into the entry and ringing a bell, a bell, a very hideous boy came out and looked at us over a spiked wicket. What do you want? said the boy. There was a follower or an officer or something here, said Mr. Jarndyce, who is dead. I want to know his name, if you please. Name of Neckett, said the boy, and his address, Bell Yard, said the boy. Chandler's shop, left-hand side, name of Blinder. We went back to Lincoln's Inn, 
where Mr. Skimpole, who had not cared to remain near Co near Coavinsis, awaited us. Then we went to Bell Yard, a narrow alley, at a very short distance. We soon found the Chandler's shop. In it was a good-natured looking old woman with a droopy or in it with with a dropsy or an asthma or perhaps both. <sighs> Naked children, she said in reply to my inquiry. <sighs> yes, surely, miss. Three pair, if you please. Door right opposite the stairs, and she handed me the key across the counter. I came out without asking any more questions and led the way up the dark stairs. We went as quickly as we could, but four of us made some noise on the aged boards, and when we came to the second story, we found we had disturbed a man who was standing there looking out of his room. Is it Gridley that's wanted? He said, fixing his eyes on me with an angry stare. No, sir, I, said I. I am going higher up. Mr. Jarndyce gave him a good day, he said abruptly and fiercely. He was a tall, sallow man with a careworn head, deeply lined face, and prominent eyes. He had a pen in his hand, and in the glimpse I caught of his room in passing, I saw that it was covered with a litter of papers. Leaving him standing there, we went up to the top room. I tapped at the door, and a little shrill voice inside said, We are locked in. Mrs. Blind has got the key. I applied the key on hearing this and opened the door. In a poor room with a sloping ceiling and containing very little furniture was a mite of a boy, some five or six years old, nursing and hushing a heavy child of eighteen months. There was no fire, though the weather was cold. Both children were wrapped in some poor shawls and tippets. Who has locked you up here alone? we naturally asked. Charlie, said the boy, standing still to gaze at us. Is Charlie your brother? No, she's my sister, Charlotte. Father called her Charlie. Are there any more of you besides Charlie? Me, said the boy, and Emma, packing the limp bonnet of the child he was nursing, and Charlie. Where is Charlie now? Out of washing, said the boy. We were looking at one another and at these two children when there came into the room a very little girl, childish in figure, but shrewd and older-looking in face. Pretty face, too, wearing a womanly sort of bonnet, much too large for her, and drying her bare hands on a womanly sort of apron. Her fingers were white and wrinkled from washing, and the soap suds were yet smoking, which she wiped off her arms. She had come running from some place in the neighborhood, and had made all the haste she could. Consequently, though she was very light, she was out of breath and could not speak at first. "'Oh, here's Charlie,' said the boy." "'Is it possible,' whispered my guardian, as we put a chair for the little creature and got her to sit down, "'that this child works for the rest? Charlie, Charlie,' said my guardian. "'How old are you?' "'Over thirteen, sir,' replied the child. "'Oh, what a great age,' said my guardian. "'What a great age, Charlie. And do you live alone here with these babies, Charlie?' "'Yes, sir,' returned the child, looking up into his face with perfect confidence. "'Since father died. And how do you live, Charlie?' Since father died, sir, I've gone out to work. I'm out washing today. And when did mother die, poor mother? Mother died just after Emma was born, said the child. Then father said I was to be as good as mother to her as as good a mother to her as I could. And so I tried, and so I worked at home and did cleaning and nursing and washing for a long time before I began to go out. And did you often go out? As often as I can, said Charlie, opening her eyes and smiling because of earning sixpence and shillings. Do you always lock the babies up when you go out? To keep them safe, sir, don't you see, said Charlie. Mrs. Blinder comes up now and then, and Mr. Gridley comes up sometimes, and perhaps I can run in sometimes, and they can play, you know, and Tom ain't afraid of being locked up, are you, Tom? No, said Tom stoutly. He's as good as gold, said the little creature, and when Emma's tired, he puts her to bed, and when he's tired, he goes to bed himself, and when I come home and light the candle and has a bit of supper, he sits up again and has it with me, don't you, Tom? Oh, yes, Charlie, said Tom. That I do. I stood at the window with Ada, pretending to look at the housetops and the blackened stack of chimneys, when I found that Mrs. Blinder from the shop below had come in and was talking to my guardian. Have many people been kind to the children? asked Mr. Jarndyce. On the whole, not so bad, sir, said Mrs. Blinder. Mr. Jarndyce was turning to speak to us when his attention was attracted by an abrupt entrance into the room of the Mr. Gridley whom we had seen on our way up. 
I don't know what you may be doing here, ladies and gentlemen, he said, as if he resented our presence, but you will excuse my coming in. I don't come in to stare about me. Well, Charlie, well, Tom, well, little one, how is all with us? To how is it with us all today? He bent over the group in a caressing way and clearly was regarded as a friend by the children, though his face retained its stern character and his manner to us was as rude as could be. My guardian noticed it and respected it. No one surely would come here to stare about him, he said mildly. Maybe so, sir, maybe so, returned the other, taking Tom upon his knee and waving him off impatiently. I don't want to argue with ladies and gentlemen. I have had enough of arguing to last one man his life, sir, said Gridley. Do you know anything of the courts of equity? Perhaps I do, to my sorrow. To your sorrow, said the man, pausing in his wrath. If so, I beg your pardon, sir. With renewed violence. I have been dragged for five and twenty years over I have been dragged for five and twenty years over burning iron. I have lost the habit of treading upon velvet. Go into the court of Chancery yonder and ask what is the one of what is one of the standing jokes that brighten up their business sometimes, and they will tell you that the best joke they have is the man from Shropshire. I he said, beating one hand on the other passionately, am the man from Shropshire. I believe I and my family have also had the honour of furnishing some entertainment in the, the same grave place, said my guardian composedly. You may have heard my name, Jaundice. Mr. Jaundice, said Gridley, with a rough sort of salutation. You bear your wrongs more quietly than I can bear mine. More than that, I tell you, and I tell you this, gentlemen. If these young ladies, if they are friends of yours, that if I took my wrongs in any other way... I should be driven mad. It is only by resenting them and by revenging them in my mind and by angrily demanding the justice I never got that I am able to keep my wits together. You may tell me that I overexcite myself. I answer that it is that it's in my nature to do it under wrong, and I must do it. There's nothing between doing it and sinking into the smelling state of the poor little madwoman that haunts the court. The passion and heat in which he was, and the violent gestures with which he accompanied what he said were most painful to see. Mr. Jarndyce, said he, consider my case. As true as there is a heaven above us, this is my case. I am one of two brothers. My father, a farmer, made a will, and left his farm and stock and so forth to my mother for her life. After my mother's death, all was to come to me, except a legacy of three hundred pounds that I was then to pay my brother. My mother died. My brother, some time afterwards, claimed his legacy. I and some of my relations said that he had had part of it already in board and lodging and some other things. Now mind, that was the question and nothing else. No one disputed the will. No one disputed anything. But whether part of that £300 had already been paid or not. To settle that question, my brother, filing a bill, <coughs> excuse me, I was obligated to go into this accursed chancery. I was forced there because the law forced me and would let me go nowhere else. Seventeen people were made defendants to that simple suit. It first came on after two years and then stopped for another two, stopped for another two years while the master, may his head rot off, inquired whether I was my father's son, about which there was no dispute at all with any mortal creature. He then found out that there were not defendants enough. Remember, there were only seventeen as yet, but that we must have another who had been left out and must begin all over again. The costs at that time, before the thing was begun, were three times the legacy. My brother would have given up the legacy and joyfully to escape more costs. The whole estate left to me in the will of my father's has gone to costs. The suit, still undecided, has fallen into rack and ruin and despair with everything else. And here I stand this day, now, Mr. Jarndyce, in your suit there are thousands and thousands involved, where in mine there are hundreds. Is mine less hard to bear, or is it harder to bear when my whole living was in it, and has been thus shamefully stuck, sucked away? I have done, he said, sitting down and wiping his face. Mr. Jarndyce, I have done. I am violent, I know. I ought to know it. I have been in prison for contempt of court. I have been imprisoning for I have been in prison for threatening the solicitor. I have been in this trouble and that trouble and shall be again. 
I am the man from Shropshire, and I sometimes go beyond amusing them, though they have found it amusing too to see me committed into custody and brought up in custody and all that. It would be better for me, they tell me, if I restrained myself. I tell them that if I did restrain myself, I should become imbecile. I was a good enough tempered man once, I believe. People in my part of the country say they remember me so. But now I must have this vent against my sense of injury or nothing could hold my wits together. Besides, he added, breaking fiercely out, I'll shame them to the last. I'll show myself to the court to it, uh, in that court to its shame. If I knew when I was going to die and could be carried there and had a voice to speak with, I would die there saying, you have brought me here and set me from here many and many a time. Now send me out feet foremost. I came to take these babies down to my room for an hour, he said, going to them again and let them play about. I didn't mean to say all this, but it don't much signify. You're not afraid of me, Tom, are you? No, Tom said. You ain't angry with me. You are right, my child. You're going back, Charlie? Ah, I come then, little one. He took the youngest child on his arm, where she was willing enough to be carried. I shouldn't wonder if we found a gingerbread soldier downstairs. Let's go and look for him. He made his former rough salutation, which was not deficient in a certain respect to Mr. Jarndyce, and bowing slightly to us, went downstairs to his room. We kissed Charlie and took her downstairs with us and stopped outside the house to see her run away to her work. And that is the end of chapter 15.